calculate all the viscous effect. But beyond that, away from the presence of the boundary layer, what else can you assume? And what equation you may even use that is acceptable? Go do it. You got it. All that is allow me to pretend the rest of the flow is invisible. And I can even just pollute it to estimate the relationship between pressure and velocity. And just by having this simple concept, I can build a better effort. <coughs> if there's more lift and less drag. Okay? So with that, I want to address for the first time the physical use of the Reynolds number concept. And then we'll take a two minutes break. Allow you to ask a question too for the second half of the lecture. So the Reynolds number we have seen so many times, this is now the first time I can relate that physically to a problem. Back in chapter Seven on dimensional analysis, when we look at Reynolds number, I told you definition is such that we are looking at two competing effects in the flow field. The denominator due to viscosity obviously is the frictional effect. The numerator is an inertial effect. <coughs> Anyone remember what that means? F equal to MA? What does that mean? Inertial effect? I step on the brake hard on the highway at 60 miles per hour, what my body do? No, I lean forward. And the faster I stop the car, the faster I lean forward. That's inertia. That because I made. All right. So as an example, when I have a flow where the Reynolds number is very, very large and much, much greater than one is the understatement. On the, air, or on the airplane airfoil, typically you're talking about 10 million Reynolds number based on the definition we have. When I have a flow where the Reynolds number is large and it's most engineering application, from automobile to submarine to airplane, what I have here then is looking at the numerator and the denominator. The inertial effect is much, much dominant compared to the viscous effect. As such, if I sketch the flow over an airfoil for the cases where the Reynolds number is in the tens of million, because the viscous effect is so small compared to the inertial effect, I will have a very thin boundary there. Just like a dictator, or one of dictated by Professor Pranko. And that's how we come up with this concept of boundary. So for most engineering problems, we are in this category, where the boundary layer concept can be used effectively to allow me to simplify the problem, solve the full field outside the boundary layer by pretending that it's implicit, and the thin layer I use much more simplified it but yet sophisticated analysis to come up with the shear and the boundary layer thickness. The other extreme of this example, where the Reynolds number is not large, it's actually near one, or even a thousand, which is still small compared to 10 meters. That is very interesting, because now I have a case where based on the physical interpretation of The ratio of the Reynolds number, now I have a case where the inertia effect is almost the same order as the viscous effect. So my concept of the boundary layer is a little bit shaky. What that means, based on this comparison, the viscous effect is equally important compared to the inertia effect, is that if I were to draw that same boundary layer, 
due to the very lowest Reynolds number, my so-called boundary layer is actually very large. My risk is region because the fact that Reynolds number is so small, one is as order of magnitude the same as the inertia effect. My viscous effect is now penetrating the entire flow field. This small thin layer or boundary layer doesn't hold anymore. So I can no longer assume the rest of the full field is invisible. The bottom line is the entire full field is seeing viscous effect. I cannot have so-called a boundary layer concept. The only way you can solve for the full field here is consider viscous effect everywhere. And that becomes obviously a more challenging problem. Fortunately for most engineering problems, we are on the right side domain. Reynolds number in the medians. But there are a few cases, and it's getting more and more interesting in the military application, where Reynolds number is going to be very, very small. Can you first tell me in everyday life example of something that will have a very, very small Reynolds number? So what is, how is Reynolds number defined? <coughs> Something to have a Reynolds number in order of one, two things has to happen. Let's say it's in air, has to be very small, <coughs> and has to go very slow. Any idea as to some everyday life application? You look up and things that fly around that is very tiny. Yeah? Uh, I was going to say like a blimp, but I guess not. A what? I was going to say like a blimp, but then you said very small. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, no, those are very big. Yeah, Drone. drones, absolutely. But even before that, how about a foot fire? Or a bumblebee? Or in your home, you're going to calculate a Reynolds number based on the tiny minnow. You know, two centimeters, swimming in water. Those poor guys actually fighting very hard because every stroke they move, think about that. Viscous effect is pulling them back. So every time you hit the fire, Think about that pool guy is swimming in, <laughs> if it's like us swimming in a pool, he or she is swimming in gelatin. Is that hard an effort to overcome viscous effect? That's a difference between low Reynolds number, which is on the left, and high Reynolds number. And drone, exactly, the military is building actually a small plane that is the size of an insect. They can fly, hover, and spy on you. That's what they're doing with. All right. Where back in the 30s, nobody cared. Panto is just very insightful to come up with this whole concept of boundary layer. Now we look at this and take it for granted. But back then, that's what made better airplanes. All right, we'll take a short break and we'll come back and continue.